John Daly. I'm here again for BQB Publishing. Today we're talking to Douglas Wellman, author of the new Holocaust book, A Teenage Girl in Auschwitz. How's it going today, Doug? Hiya, John. I always love talking to you. It seems we only do it when I write uh, a new book. So I guess I'm just going to have to write faster. <laughs> I'm doing right. fine. You... Great, great. Well, you put them out pretty fast. So that's, that's great. That's <laughs> great. Uh... <laughs> So before we get into your new book, um, which is obviously on a very serious and sobering topic, I wanted to talk a bit about you and your background. Um, I find your, your biography incredibly interesting. You were a, uh, a Hollywood television producer and director for many years, and much of uh, that work was in comedy. Um, can you talk about that chapter of your career and what drew you to comedy? I must say that as someone who... Uh, follows you on social media as well. You have a really good, fantastic sense of humor and I, uh, I really appreciate it. So I'm interested to see how this part of your career started. Well, you know, I was always interested in, in comedy as far back as I can remember as a, as a child. And uh, it just struck me that spending your time laughing was a whole lot more interesting than, you know, being unhappy. So I was always directed in, in that uh, area. You know, there was a, a famous man named Napoleon Hill. He wrote a book about a hundred years ago. Uh, he started about, it's called Think and Grow Rich. And the thesis of that book is that people tend to end up where they, th doing things they think about. And I think that was quite true in, in, in my situation because I was this little kid who liked comedy and uh, but i also liked uh, television broadcasting i was very interested in that and so i moved uh, merged the two at some point i was a producer director or director primarily in minneapolis st paul television director then i moved to los angeles um i got with the hope of getting into comedy television and i uh and i was lucky i i got in uh, my first show was a situation comedy called Facts of Life, uh, which I, it was a very nice show with very nice, everything was, the show oozed niceness, you know, and, but I was the production manager and I uh, wanted to be a director again. And I was uh, a short time thereafter, I was working for a studio as a production manager. And about once or twice a week, I would go up into the, you know, production executive's office to talk. And, and I would say, um, you know, I'm also a director. I'm, I'm really a director. And he'd say something like, well, that's real nice, Doug. I'm happy for you. You know, and that was, that was it. So I was sitting in my office one day and the phone rang. And he said, you got to come here right away. Okay, fine. Went down to his office and he said, um, Joan Collins is on stage two right now to do a uh, public service spot. And I forgot she was going to be here. And I got a stage and I got a crew, but I don't have a director. Didn't you tell me one time you knew something about directing? And I said, I might have mentioned that. Uh, can you do this? Yes, I can do it. Okay. Do you have the script? No. Okay. Do you know what it's about? No. Fine. When is she here? Now. Perfect. So uh, I, I'm i late and I don't know what I'm doing. And Joan Collins at the time was a huge television star with a show called Dynasty. And I thought, this is a great thing. I'm going to be down there look like a complete fool. But I went down and, uh, Joan, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, rehearse these cue cards before we go? That's how I learned what we were talking about. And then uh, it happened to be about something I knew something about. So I think, well, you know, John, how important this is because you know that that organization does what it is. Oh, really? I didn't. So anyway, now Joan and I are fast friends. We shoot the spot. Meanwhile, the head pooba of uh, production is up in his office waiting for something to hit the fan. And it didn't. And so after that, I became a director just because. And, and from there, then I had the opportunity to, uh, move out into the world of comedy again, but that time at a different level. And I had so much fun. The years when I spent doing stand-up comedy shows, for example, a lot of those were traveling. It was like you took your family with you because the, the comedy world was a family. 
And I really did enjoy that so much. I just, I just had a great time. And I did a little, uh, a little writing, but mostly I was a producer and director and um, just thoroughly enjoyed it. The business is quite different now. It's not the way it was when I was engaged in it, but, but I uh, saw yeah. Well, that's great. That's interesting. You uh, also, part of your, your bio, you earned a uh, theology degree and served for years as a pastor working with uh, homeless people in Los Angeles. You were also a Bible teacher at a, a Utah prison and then served as a hospital chaplain. So you're not only filled with the uh, comedic spirit, but also the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm curious, has your faith always been you know, a big part of your life or is that something that came later, uh, perhaps after working with too many celebrities? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was raised in a church very nice church, very nice people. Uh, but I was about 16 years old. Uh, it, it wasn't a teaching church. They did what I, what I've now come to call the be good to your mother sermon. You know, you should go out in the world and do nice things. So, and so I thought, well, you know, this is a lot like Boy Scouts only without the fun. So I don't know that I necessarily be, have to be. Here. So I left and about 20 years later, I was working as a director in, in Hollywood. And I got very, very ill, very ill. And I, I couldn't quite shake the thing. And an actress that I was working with said, well, why don't you come to church with me? So I thought, oh, okay, it certainly can't hurt. I don't have anything against it. And she took me to a church where they actually taught the Bible. And after about 45 minutes, I went, oh, so that's what this is all about. <laughs> I kind of, I'm going to stick around. I'm interested in this. And and so I did. And I just kept learning and learning and learning. And about a decade after that first experience, I had another uh, life crisis. And it was a whopper. I mean, it was took me a long time to get out of it. And when I did, I thought, you know, I'm not the only one who's had the world fall in on them. Maybe, maybe I could be helpful to someone. And I was already interested in, you know, obviously in Bible study at that time. So I went and I got a theology degree. Initially, just kind of for my own interest. And then I decided, I, I think I want to help people. I should do something. And uh, then the, the, the homeless thing just kind of fell in my lap. I don't even remember exactly how it happened, except that. I suddenly found myself on Skid Row, which was a thoroughly horrible place back then. What it's like today, I, I can't even imagine. And I did that for a, 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 with uh, homeless people for um, for a while. Uh, but there was so much hardcore drug addiction and uh, mental illness that it was really hard for me to to do anything except try to be of some comfort. And you know, I, that, was, that was about it. So I started looking around for someplace else, and I found a, um, a ministry in the in the uh, San Fernando Valley, and that was a different experience. Uh, not that same level of drug addiction and mental illness. And through a very strange series of events, I suddenly found myself being the co-director of the ministry. And uh, so every week I spoke to uh, I spoke. And then we gave the, the homeless people a hot meal and clothes. And then I stayed around and did individual counseling. And that was, I did that for six years until uh, I retired. And then we moved to Utah and I didn't have anything to do for a while. And it was kind of bugging me. But the church I was attending had a ministry to prison uh, inmates. So I thought, well, okay, fine, I'll try that. And I did that for a while. And then I discovered that uh, most about 70 percent of the inmates are there because of some involvement with drugs so i the state of utah department of human services uh provided classes for me to attend and i got certified as a drug counselor and, and a disaster crisis counselor and so and by this time of course i was a licensed uh, reverend and so um, I went back, we worked at the prison and along about the time COVID hit, I heard that there was an opening uh, 
in the local hospital here for a chaplain. And so I thought, oh, well, that's great. I'll go over there and, you know, they'll do all the stuff I've done. They'll probably be happy to see me, uh, which was incorrect. They had some pretty stiff standards in what they wanted. And I did get the, I did get the job, but it also came with a commitment to two more years of education, which was followed by uh, becoming board certified, which was some more hoops. But I, I jumped through them, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that I have a chance to be with people. I work in intensive care and also in the palliative care departments. And, uh, you know, there's generally, you wouldn't think, a lot of room for humor in those areas. But I found that a lot of times in those circumstances, people really need a relief from, from what's going on. Not all the time. I mean, they always need the relief, but you got to be a little careful. But uh, I found that the humor can be very valuable. I had a patient. I was in with her for about 40 minutes, I think. And her husband was sitting, you know, next to us. And he was just basically staring at the floor. And she cried for the first two thirds of that visit. And then I was able to slowly turn things around. And by the time I left, they were laughing. As I, as I walked out of the room, the husband said, hey, wasn't that great? So I don't know how long that lasted. Was it an hour? Was it a day? I, I don't know. But for a brief period of time, that little bit of humor gave her some relief. So you never know. You just never know. That's that's a great story, I, and I, I mean, I'm sure they they took that with them for a while after that. Um, so let's talk about your new book, "A uh, Teenage Girl in Auschwitz." It's it's a true story, um, an emotionally gripping and very compelling one. Uh, can you tell us a bit about it? Um, "A Teenage Girl in Auschwitz," like all of my former books, came to me. I didn't go looking for it. it that's another kind of interesting thing that's happened in my life. Uh, I, I did a little consulting for the government many, many, many years ago, and I met a, um, uh, at the time he was a major general, and we became friends, and he had a story that he talked to me about. That became Box of the Secret Life of Howard Hughes. Uh, I had, um, um, I got a call from our publisher, Terry, one afternoon, Terry never calls me on my cell phone, never. We, we talk by all the time by email. She never calls me on the cell phone. She called me one afternoon and said, I just talked to a man whose mother survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. This looks like it has you written all over it. Do you want it? And so, yeah, so I called him. And then I had um, my friend, John Biner. I worked with him on his autobiography and a missionary in Burma I worked on with her. And then a friend of mine read uh, Surviving Hiroshima, a young woman's story. And she said, well, wait a minute. I went to college with uh, a young woman whose grandmother survived Auschwitz. Would you like to talk to her? Oh yeah, sure. So they made the connection and, and that's how that started. And I was fortunate to not only have the family's interest in support in this. But Basha Freelich, who was the who was the subject of the book, after the war left two recorded testimonies of her experiences. One uh, was with Graz College that was done in the 80s, and then the other one was done in the 90s with the Shoah Foundation. Uh, and so they, uh, so I had the opportunity to hear Bosch's own words and to use them. And then, of course, there was the usual ton of research <laughs> that, that goes with these kind of things. Uh, one, of the, one of the sad things is when I talk to people, particularly younger people, they have no idea of what that was all about. And so uh, that I felt it, I had to put in some. Um, historical context around this because nobody would know why why that had happened. 
so that uh, I've, I've each, almost all of the chapters uh, use Bosch's words as well as my research. And then at the end, there's a section called uh, um, historical context uh, or historical perspective. And so then the reader, if they're not familiar with the war and all of this, uh, then can, can read that and say, oh, I see how that happened. So, um, so that's kind of the way the book is constructed. But I wrote the book initially because as a you know amateur historian for the last 40 years, uh, I wanted to contribute to that um, part of the historical record because this is a very, Basha was 14 years old when she was taken to Auschwitz. And while there are, there's a lot of material on the concentration camps and there are uh, some stories from concentration camp survivors not much from the perspective of a 14 year old girl. And so I thought that was critical that, that that be published, that that become part of the record. The second reason for the book was that I, I believe each and every one of us has, we're a storehouse of determination uh, and, and abilities that we, we don't really necessarily recognize because so few of us are pushed to the point where we have to dig that deeply in ourselves. Uh, Basha did that. She promised her mother, uh, you know, really minutes before her mother was executed, she promised her that she, that Basha would live to tell the story to the world. And that that's the will to live. She dug down and she found that and she did live. And now, I'm, I'm telling the story. And I want people to understand that, that that determination, that willpower, that courage, there's some of that in all of us. We just need to think about that every once in a while, realize it's there before we really need it. And then the last thing uh, that I wanted to, to get out was that you know, we have been blessed to live in a nice, safe little country. You know, most of us haven't had too many horrible things happen to us. We haven't been invaded. You know, we haven't had atomic bombs drip, dropped on us. We haven't been herded behind barbed wire for no reason. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. History does repeat itself. And it repeats itself to people who don't understand that it can repeat itself. So part of this is directed at everyone to understand that you need to pay a little attention. Yeah, you need to understand that there are, that evil does exist. A friend of mine called me um, a few hours ago about the book. Uh, he, you know, I'd sent him a copy and he said that people have to understand that evil does not have a limit it's there. It seems like there's a limit on good things, but there is no limit on bad things. And you don't want to be caught in that. So that was another reason that, that I just want people to understand however, however pleasant their life may be. It doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who want to mess with us. So that was the third reason. And I think, I think the, way, the approach you've taken um, with this book and other nonfiction books, um, you, you do take this approach from a personal perspective, you know, um, people can read history books and, and get the facts and everything. But there is something to be said, I think, for these personal stories that people can really relate to. And, um, you know, like you said, you you've written a number now about um, these horrific situations and surviving them. And there's something very, very inspirational about it, too, is, is, is dark as these people's experiences are, the fact that they can, you know, survive yeah. and come back from them is, is really something. Well, you know, um, first of all, yes, they are personal stories. And that's one of the big things that I enjoy about them, that we're talking about real human beings, not some concept. And if you take a story like uh, a teenage girl in Auschwitz, particularly working with the family, it's pretty darn hard to write that without 
getting emotionally involved, which I did in a, in a pretty big way. Um, but also my writing style is something that I learned uh, back when I was a child, really, the, the beginnings of that. And that was uh, the first writer that I remember following was a guy by the name of Tom McCahill, who was a columnist for Mechanics Illustrated magazine. And I was a 10 year old car nut and McHale had an interesting sense of humor, which is based on how he played with words. And that stuck in my mind. And that was the beginning of understanding the power of words if they're put together in the right order. And also, as my life went on, the realization that reading anything should be interesting. You know, uh, McKay Hill could get you very engaged in a sentence about a car transmission. <laughs> you know, he could. He just had that. that you know. And I realized that that people want to know what they want to know, but they also uh, reading shouldn't be an endurance contest for them. If you look at, I mean, I hate to say this, but I will. Academic writing can be brutal, you know, um, and, and that's not what I want to do. I want my readers, even if I'm writing about something horribly unpleasant, to be engaged in every single sentence so that not only do I tell a story, but reading it has some level of pleasure, I guess, for lack of a, a better word. Even, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that, but yes. Well, or, you know, emotional investment, emotional interest. I, I think that's, yeah. a, that's a good part of it. To be emotionally invested in it, but to I'm this is me talking when I write these books. This is me talking uh, in in uh, a teenage girl in Auschwitz. I quote heavily from Bosch's testimonies, you know, and that's her words. That's really the core of the book. But when I'm writing the rest of it, this is what Doug thinks of the situation. I don't change, you know. I, they're all factual. Uh, I don't do anything, you know don't write about things that didn't happen or I don't stick my opinions into everything. But this is the way I tell stories like I would tell you, John, if we were sitting down and I wanted to tell you Bosch's story, this is the way I would tell it to you. And I think the readers feel that, you know, they feel that they're being, they're being, they're having a conversation with somebody who could be their friend. That's what I hope. And you're a very good storyteller for sure. I, I, these are some. These are. Some, this is some great work you're doing here. Um, what What did you find most rewarding and also most difficult about writing um, a teenage girl in Auschwitz? Well, uh, I'll tell you the first tough thing: the testimony that Basha did for the Shoah Foundation was a video testimony. It was done in the '90s. And I, you know, I can't work from recordings when I'm doing this. I need a written transcript. Well, the, the interviews that they did, I mean, Basha, Basha spoke like seven languages. So she was very good. But as we, as I went through this, uh, she's, there are words that are Polish, German, Hebrew, and Yiddish. None of those are languages that I speak or necessarily understand. That meant I, I couldn't send this off to a transcription service because I have no idea what I would get back. I mean, it would be much people I'd send it to wouldn't know any more than I do, which meant I had to transcribe it personally. And that involved in the Shoah Foundation interview, watching Basha tell the story. She would, that was her face talking to me through the screen. And that was tough. That was right off the bat tough. Yeah, I'm a pretty, you know, I'm not a shrinking pilot. I can take a lot of kicking around. I mean, I work in an intensive care unit. People come in with missing parts, you know, and, and, and I talk. 
But watching Basha tell that story, I think I had to break it into three or four sessions because it would come to a point where I'd say, okay, I think that's enough of this for a while. I think that's enough of this. And then I worked with her daughter, Evelyn. Obviously, uh, Basha was her mother. Evelyn can't talk to me without the understanding that this person is being treated like that is her mother. And so that was, that was, so getting through that was, um, that was an emotional, uh, emotional strain. Um, and that was, I think, the, the most difficult part. I found, for some strange reason, over the years, I used to hate research, and suddenly I like it. So I'm, as I look across my office here, I have three huge boxes of research materials that I used to write this book. And the amount of stuff that I actually used from those three boxes is fairly small. But you never know what you're looking for until you find it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I quit counting at 2,000 pages of research material. After that, I don't want to know. Just keep it coming. I'll pick through that. So that was more of a, a time consumption situation than it was, you know, taxing. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to go through. And, um, and then my first draft of, well, I was in a situation where I was afraid I wasn't going, going to make the September 12, 23 publishing cycle. And so I sent the book to Terry with a little note that said, uh, by the way, this isn't finished. <laughs> Please <laughs> indulge me. And, you know, Terry was, we've done several books together. So she kind of took me at my word that I would, in fact, fix it. But in that draft, I'd combined the historical, um, the historical perspective with Basha's story, knew, knowing that that didn't work because it was just messing up her story, really. Uh, and so then I had to figure out how to separate all of the pieces and the editors who worked on the book and, and Terry herself, um, you know, got into this and we, f we finally settled on something that I think works very well. I, I got a pre publication, we had several pre-publication reviews, and, and one of them, the, the woman who did the review, was just ecstatic that it had been separated like that, so she could had, have the historical perspective, but she didn't have to break away from Bosch's story to get it. And I thought, I saw that review and I went, that's perfect. That's exactly what this was supposed to be about. So, but uh, other than that, it was just... You know, I think I had, I got more wound up during doing the editing on this book than I did on writing it. It was just like, you know, and we, uh, you know, Right Life has a couple of very sharp eyed editors, you know, and uh, occasionally, you know, I want to, anyway, but I got past that. And they were, you know, for the most part, they were right. But when you're getting hit with a lot of stuff at the same time after spending three years of your life fiddling around, not always a walk in the park. So that was, that was interesting, and I'm, I'm pleased with the way it turned out. And I do appreciate all of the, you know, the, the people at Right Life who hopped in to uh, help me smooth this out. Oh, it's it's definitely paid off. I mean, I've I've seen some of those early reviews. You mentioned one, but yeah, you've gotten some some very high praise for this book. So. That's, a, that's something to be excited about. What what message, um, Doug, do you hope that readers take away from this book? There's probably more than one, but um, I'm kind of curious, what, what is it you hope they get the most out of from this book? I hope that they understand by looking at what that 14-year-old girl went through, the fact that she not only survived that, but in the end, and I haven't really mentioned this too much, in the end, she, she met a, a man who had also been a concentration camp prisoner, Samuel Freelich. They were married, they emigrated to the United States, and they became very successful business people, starting from a position where they didn't have any money to eat. And you look at that and you go, okay, this is outstanding. That's 
an amazing story of human determination. And we don't think about it too much. And I want people to understand that that's, that's in there. You know, my, my father, um, my father was an attorney and, uh, he said a lot of things to me, but a couple of them were anything you want, you better be prepared to work for. And when you're working for something, don't quit, you know? And so Basha, I think is a great example of that. She was literally staying alive so she could tell her story and she didn't quit and she wanted to sometimes it's in the book she there were times when she said this is it i can't take this anymore but she kept going and the same thing when they came to the united states and and went into business she, you know things weren't always all that rosy and she said no i'm gonna keep going and she did and they became very successful i want people to know that that's in them and then the other part that I mentioned is uh, just because you, you know, you think things are pleasant now, if you do think that way, you need to keep an eye on, on the world and see what people are doing. And don't make the assumption that everything is doing things that are going to be in your favor, because that is not at all true. Not at all true. Be prepared. And that's what I would say. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for your time, uh, Doug. Uh, can you tell people how to find out more about you and your books? Uh, yes, I have a new website that's in uh, development right now. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe by the end of the week, it'll be up. Uh, DouglasWellmanAuthor.com. And on the Amazon website, there are some little bits and pieces of autobiographical things uh, there uh, that people can look at. And I'm also uh, in the process of working. I have a YouTube channel called Douglas Wellman Author. And uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Douglas Wellman Author on YouTube. Uh, it, it's been there for a while. I only had the Howard Hughes book up on it, but now I'm decided that perhaps I'm wasting an entire channel. Why don't I do something? So I will be adding to that too. And uh, if the new, when the new website comes up, uh, people will, there will be a contact box on the site. If anyone really feels motivated to get in touch with me, hopefully that will work. Okay. I previously, previously on, on the old website, there was one of those contact things and I didn't realize it, but people who were contacting me on that, I wasn't getting their emails. And I just discovered that recently, which is hugely embarrassing. So now I got to go back and, and see if I can dig up all those. Some of those have been up there for two years and I got to oh, wow. say, I am so sorry that I did not get your email because uh, that, that's embarrassing. I don't, I don't that kind of thing so oh that's all right yeah. I, I i sometimes check the one on mine and i got people just calling me names usually <laughs> so it's, hopefully you got hopefully you have you get better ones than i do well you know but your books are fascinating in their own way because they're they're thrillers and uh, and i find it very interesting because all of that comes out of you i can go to wikipedia you know if i want and find out some things about what i work on but everything that you do comes out of your head, which I find uh, fascinating. <laughs> and my head has very little in it, but yours seems to be brimming with stuff. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that, Doug. And it was great talking to you today. Um, we'll also put up your website at the end of this video for people to check it out. And um, All right. That's my, that's my next step today, to get the web developer and say, hey, I like this. How about if we put it online? Maybe that would be. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, everybody, please check out a teenage girl from Auschwitz. You can get it wherever books are sold. Uh, thanks again, Douglas. I really uh, I always enjoy talking to you and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, John. Best to you. Thank you.